Welcome. Uh, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to spend uh, the longest passage. We're going to be in several passages uh, prior to that. But um, I will mention for those that are, that are here, we do have an offering plate. Uh, those who like to give towards our missionary offering, um, you can leave that in the offering plate up here. And my brother Bill will take that after the, uh, uh, before the next service and, and make sure we get that included in there. So we'll be thinking about our missions conference coming up in February um, if you want to contribute towards that. So we've been studying, this is our next to last lesson on real Christianity, and we've been studying, uh, this, one, this week we'll be looking at the comeback kids. Last week we, um, we looked at uh, falling forward or, and uh, how we, um, as, a, as a believer, we're, we're, we're going to fall, and how do we recover from that. And so this one, we're kind of looking at that a little bit further, a little bit deeper, and looking specifically at what is repentance. Um, Proverbs chapter 24. Uh, verse 16, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. We'll be, get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and uh, just to um, open up our hearts, Lord, and, and hear what you have for us, Lord. I pray just help us, uh, help me, Lord, where areas I need to repent and turn to you, Lord. Help me to focus uh, my heart on you, Lord. Help me to be moldable for you as, as you would have us be. And I thank you for this time together and thank you for um, this opportunity. And we praise you and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the just man falleth seven times and rises back up. It's interesting there. It says the idea that we would think a just man would be what? Would avoid falling, right? But he says there, no, the just man falls how many times? Not just once, not occasionally, but seven times. But what's really important is what makes the, the man, this, this person just, is what? They rise back up. What's the contrast there, he says? But the wicked shall fall into mischief. The idea there, the, the idea of falling into mischief is, is they don't get back up. They stay there. They wallow in it. And so let's talk about what, is it that, what makes that difference. What is repentance? What makes us rise back up? The Lord does. Let's, let's look at what repentance is not first. It's easy for us to think about repentance, and we have a picture in our mind. Uh, when, when we say repentance, sometimes we think it's guilt or shame or condemnation. Uh, is, is, is repentance when we're guilty, we feel guilty or we feel shameful or we're condemned? No, it's more than that. Uh, it's not just the feelings. It's not just the uh, it's not, condemnation is what? Is condemnation victorious or is it defeated? Defeated, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not merely regret, remorse, or self-abasement. It's not putting yourself down and just, um, you know, just regretting everything that you've done. It's not penance. It's not atonement, payment, or punishment. Who is our payment, our atonement, our payment, our punishment, and our penance? Jesus Christ, right? So repentance is not us trying to gain that, right? We're not trying to, to get, pe- we're not trying to do penance, or we're not trying to get payment, uh, or do payment for, for what we've done wrong. Repentance is not asking forgiveness over and over again, hoping that eventually it'll stick. It is not regaining or reclaiming salvation. When we, how many times do we need to repent to be saved? Once, right? We'll look at that a little bit later. But the idea that repentance doesn't get me salvation, it doesn't, or continuing to repent doesn't mean I'm going to eventually get salvation if I repent enough. So let's look at what the definition of repentance is. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says, As many as I loved, I rebuked and chastened. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's interesting. He says there, be zealous and repent. When we think of zealousness, what's zealousy? We don't really use that word today. Kind of, kind of sounds like jealousy. Uh, probably has similar feelings that are involved in it. But what's, what's zealous? Excited. Excited. Uh, I gave you a, a definition up there. But to be moved with earnest desire. There's an excitement about it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, you ever see someone get ready for a game day? Yeah, it's game day. Uh, I'm going to watch the game. What, what do they do? They go through certain rituals and they get excited. They put on the jersey. They get the right food ready and they get they get their their spot on the couch and they're ready to, you know, ready for game day. That's a zealous about that game. Why do we call people fanatics or fans? It's because they're fanatics. Uh, the idea he says there: be zealous, be excited, uh, go over the top. Therefore, and what he says: repent. 
Be excited and repent. Repent, repentance, what does that mean? That means essentially to think differently. So he says in Revelation 3, uh, 3.19, it says, as, I lo- as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And sometimes we stop there and we're like, okay, repentance is about feeling uh, bad about stuff and, and gotta, uh, I feel bad about my sin and I got to get it right. But he says it's not just feeling, it's not feeling bad about my sin. It's not about the need to be rebuked and chastened. What's he say there? Be the zealous therefore and repent. It's the idea that when we do wrong, where do we run to? Do we go and hide or do we run to Jesus? Uh, we think of as a, as a child and a parent. Uh, it's the idea that when my kid does something wrong, where do they go to? Sometimes I, I, I'm learning more and more. My kids, I mean, I probably was like this as a kid. I don't see my parents in the room. so. Um, but I was probably like this as a kid. You know, you think you're smarter than your parents, that you can get away with stuff, right? Um, we, we joke we have two locusts in our house now. We have middle schoolers, so they eat everything. Um, and, and so all the food we keep finding is disappearing. And, uh, you know, they think they can get away with it by leaving the bag back there or leaving the box there and it's empty. And it's like, where did all this food go? Um, you know, and then, then they fess up when we bring it out. I'm like, hey, where'd this go? Uh, you know, and the idea is, as believers, you know, sometimes we think we can get away with it. If we just leave it there, we'll just get away with it instead of confessing and saying, look, mom, I'm sorry, I ate all the marshmallows. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Uh, actually, I just, I, I ate one and I kept going. Um, you know, we, need to, we need to be able to run towards, uh, run to Jesus when we, when we fail, zealously, not just, not just because we have to, but because we want to. And we'll talk about that some more. We think about repentance, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So what is repentance? Repentance is first acknowledging sin. Repentance is confessing sin. And repentance is forsaking sin. So first we have to realize what? We have to realize what? About our sin. That it's sin, right? You got to realize that we have sinned. That it is sin and that that, that we have sinned. Then we've got to acknowledge that we're the ones at fault. When someone confesses, what do they do? They admit there's a. I was working with a police officer, and he was telling me we're talking about how to uh, make businesses safer and things like that. He said there was a uh, guy who had um, got caught breaking into a place, and he got. And the, he was riding back with the uh, police, uh, one of the police officers, to the station, and he said, uh, he says, yeah, I was going to rob that place, but I didn't. And he's like, well, why? So he started taking the, the criminal around, and the criminal started showing him all the reasons why in the places he didn't rob. Um, you know, but he, was, you know, he didn't realize he had confessed to that first crime, right? He, he was guilty. You know, there was no doubt that he was guilty of breaking in somewhere. Um, and he, he, he almost confessed to the other things that he, he had done. Uh, but the idea is, is when we confess, we're, we're accepting responsibility. It's, I can't, I'm not blaming anybody else. It's me. So in repentance, I'm acknowledging that there is wrong. I'm confessing that I'm the one that did it. And then this is the important piece. What do we talk about? What's, what is repentance? It's thinking differently, right? So I can't just say, yeah, it's wrong. Yep, I did it. I'm going to keep doing it. What's, what's core to repentance here? Forsaking. Forsaking, turning around and going the other way. Choosing a different path. See, we think uh, we've got to be careful, as I mentioned earlier, that salvation is not um, repenting over and over and over again, right? Our first, when we think of salvation, that's our first repentance, right? That's that's how we first repent. How how do we do that? What What are we asked to do in salvation? We're acknowledging what? I am a sinner. Lord, I am a sinner. Then we have to acknowledge what? Christ, you're the only way I can get rid of this sin. You're the only payment for my sin. And then we have to acknowledge what? Our position in Christ. When, when, when Christ said what? The devils believe and do what? Tremble. Do they turn from their sin? No. So we've got to acknowledge that we've got to forsake our sin. We've got to turn away and acknowledge that we are a new creature in Christ, which we've been looking at for the last few weeks. So are we, we think about repentance. That's the first example of repentance, of acknowledging our sin, acknowledging who paid our sin, and then acknowledging um, the, the forsaking our sin as we move forward. Psalms 139. We think of David. We talked about this one a little bit last week. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. What was David asking here? Had David sinned in his life? Absolutely. 
And here we see David, he says, and see if there be any wicked way in me. He didn't say, just show me my wicked way. Don't just let me acknowledge my wicked way. What's he say at the very end? Lead me in the way everlasting. He says, don't just show me my wicked ways, but show me the better way. Show me the everlasting way. He says, repentance, and this is the author, is taking responsibility for my sin. Repentance itself does not generate life change, but it does bring me to a place where life change is possible by the Holy Spirit. So I can change, I can make a different choice, right? But is that going to change, is that going to help me grow in Christ just because I made a different choice? We looked at this last week. Where does growth come from? It's in that what the author talks about. Where does growth come from? Where does our, where does our molding and shaping come from? From the Word of God. And who's our potter in this? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's working in us. The Holy Spirit is bringing that change in our life. I can do a lot of things myself. And if I start to think I can repent and change my life myself, what's, what am I doing? Religion. Remember, we talked about that. All I'm doing is I'm just going well, to do, di- do something different today. That's just religion. That's me working in my own efforts. I'm still wallowing in my sin in a lot of ways. Um, but the righteous man turns and turns in the right direction and follows Christ. So let's look at the results. Of, we'll come back to that idea in a minute. But look at the results of repentance. Repentance. In Jeremiah 17, verse 23, it says, But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they may not hear nor receive instruction. You ever seen, uh, I've, I've seen it with my kids at some point when they get really um, um, stubborn and, and don't, wanna, don't really want to listen, and they just get really stiff. Like, I'm not, if I don't see you, or even, even my, my pet does that sometimes, if I don't see you, then I don't make eye contact with you, then you don't exist. I mean, that's the idea he's talking about here. Like, if I don't listen to God, I, you know, I, they, didn't, they didn't obey, they didn't incline their ear, they made their neck stiff, and they said that they may not hear nor receive instruction. Repentance. You know, if, if we, uh, there's some things that we, uh, that, we, if, we, if we try to do it of ourselves that prevent us from repenting, pride, self-justification, blame shifting, lying, rationalization. When we think about those things, the, the idea, we'll talk about some of those things that keep us from repentance in a minute, but the idea that all of those are of ourselves, right? Trying to protect ourselves, uh, shifting the blame. It wasn't me. Um, justifying myself. Well, if you only knew the situation I was in, or rationalizing it. Um, th- the idea that repentance takes, t- takes us away from that situation and puts us humbled, listening to what God wants, owning our actions, facing it with truth, and recognizing their current situation. So when you think about where they were in Jeremiah, what did he say? They didn't obey. They obeyed not. They didn't incline their ear. They were stiff-necked, did not hear or receive instruction. What is the result of repentance? You think of the, uh, the clay and the potter. If the, imagine if the, the clay was alive and it could, it could fight the work of the potter. What, would that, what does the potter have to do to get that play, that, even to start the bowl, if he's going to start it? What's the potter do? Okay, so he, he heats it. How does he heat it? He, mold, he, he needs it. You ever worked with bread? It's the idea that I'm going to need it. I'm going to get this pliable so that it's workable. When we're repenting. What are we doing with our hearts? We're making our hearts pliable. We're saying, God, here's my heart. It's, it's, it's open for you. I was wrong. Uh, or I, I'm wrong in this area. Change me, mold me. Uh, the idea that is the, the, uh, Jeremiah, that they were stiff necked. They, they were like a rock. You ever left Plato out before and try to come back to it later? You didn't put the top on right or whatever. You come back to Plato. Is it easy to work with Plato? Not at all. It's dried out. It's crusty. And that's the idea here. If, we, if we're not repenting, if we're not being moldable, um, then, it's, you know, then, then we're being stiff-necked like these, uh, these in Jeremiah. So what leads to repentance? How do we get to repentance? First off, we've got to know what motivates us. We talked earlier about repentance, what it's not. Repentance is not me needing to atone for my sins. John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Is repentance me trying to atone for my sins and trying to, Oh God, I messed up. I need to, do, I need to make it right. Is that what repentance is? 
No, because who already made it right? Christ. What's it say there in 1 John 2? He is what? Our propitiation. He's our payment. He is the one that is taking care of all of our sins, satisfied, not just the sins we already did and we, we confess for salvation, but every sin that we're going to commit. He says, not just for mine, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, when we think we can make atonement for our sins through repentance, what are we making of Christ? What are we saying about Christ's salvation? That it wasn't enough. When we think that our, when we think that our repentance can lead to something better, then we, we're, we're taking the glory away from Christ. 1 John 4.10, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, when you think about repentance, this is not about punishment. Who took the punishment of sin for us? Jesus Christ. So if we operate and we, we come to Christ and we repent out of fear, what, what, are we, what are we taking away from Christ? If I'm afraid that I'm going to be punished because I sinned, what am I taking away from Christ? His glory, right? What did he do for us? He, he died on the cross to take that punishment for our sins. So, so fear shouldn't motivate our repentance. Christ already took the punishment for all our sins, and this is the author. Uh, sin may have consequences and chastisement, but God never says to his children, repent or be punished. Now, sometimes we hear chastisement, right? We're like, oh, that's punishment, right? No, that's correction. There's a difference between punishment and correction. Um, punishment is what? That's a payment, right? That, that's, that's, that's taking back what, we, what, what, is, what is owned. Chastisement is correction. That's helping get us back on the right path. So we think about it, our, our repentance. Repentance isn't there for punishment, or isn't, isn't our alternative to punishment. Repentance is us getting our hearts right with God. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness and, forbear and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So what should motivate us to repent? What should motivate us and make us want to repent? God's goodness. That's what he say there. Literally, he says, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We think about our situation as a child and a parent. If I mess up, what's going to happen if I try to hide it or I try to fix it myself? You ever seen kids try to fix stuff themselves? Oh, I marked on the wall. Let me try to fix it. And they start scrubbing. What happens to that mark? It gets bigger and bigger, right? If I would have gone to my parent immediately, they probably know that magic, you know, use that vinegar or whatever it is, and it's just going to wipe it right off. But that's the idea. If we, if we try to fix it ourselves, what are we going to do? We're just going to make it worse. We should realize that God is good. God has already paid our payments, of our, our sin. He is there and he wants us to come to him because he is good. Uh, that, he, you know, that his love should motivate us to repentance. He says there at the beginning, what? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. When we don't repent, what are we doing? What are we saying to the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? We're despising them. That's what he's saying. He says, what? Despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. We're basically saying, God, I know you're, you, you're really good and I know you care, you're, you're long suffering, but you know what? I don't really care about all that because I think I can do it myself. I think I can fix it myself. God's goodness should motivate us to repentance. Go ahead, we're in uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 11. And y'all know this parable. A certain man... Uh, and Jesus tells, is telling the publicans and sinners here, um, and he says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and divided uh, unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And we would spend all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and it began to be in want. And we and he joined to this to be a citizen, or would, joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the hunks of, of that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, "How many hired servants in my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger." I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son than to make one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. 
But when he, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. Uh, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We look at this, this example that he gives, and I know the prodigal son isn't just about this son, it's about the other son's reaction. But we think about this example of repentance. What is, what is the son, uh, when does the son finally repent of what he did? When he was down. When he was, he was what? He was feeding the swine. But he wasn't just feeding the swine. What was he doing with the swine? He was eating with the swine. We think about where this son was. He refused to repent because he, of his own pride, of his own, own thought that he, he, could, he could take it on himself. And then even in his repentance, I would caution that we don't use his, his repentance as a model for repentance. Because what does he say? He doesn't run to his father because his father um, is, 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 is forgiving him or has always been forgiving and long-suffering. What's he go to his father for? Because he knows that they, he, his father takes care of the hired people better than he does. Uh, he, he could just be a hired person, he says there, and have bread enough to spare. But we see the goodness, and this is what I want you to catch on to. What is the goodness of his father? Who's the father in this spiritually? It's God, right? We're talking about this as the example of God. What is the goodness of that father? He says what? He sees him afar off, and he does what? He forgives him. He, he, had, he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is when he saw him afar off. He had already had compassion on him because he knew his son had come back to him. And we think about ourselves in repentance. This is the goodness of the father. The father didn't, did, had the son apologize at that point and said, Dad, I'm sorry. What did he do? Or he didn't yell, hey, Dad, I'm sorry. And the dad said, okay, I'm going to run to you. I'm going to give you a hug. What did he say? Nothing. He didn't even have a chance to. This is the example of the Father. What has God done for us before we even had a chance to repent? He's done everything. He's done everything. He did everything he could to show his love. He's run to us. He came to us. How did he come to us? Jesus Christ. And we think of that example, that when we think about our repentance, you know, then what does the son do in verse 21? He says, Father, I have sinned against thee in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. What's he doing there? He's acknowledging his sin. He's, he's, he's understanding what repentance is, but, uh, but, he understand, but he's, he's doing it because he's hungry. He's not doing it because his father's goodness, right? He knows his father's good, but that drives him there. Um, but he's, he's repenting because of what he had done. He says, and, bring, and his father goes on and he says what? Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring forth the fatted calf and let us eat and be merry. Does the, father, does the father hold it against him and say, you know what, that's great. You need to go work in the field now. I'm glad you're back. All this work that you didn't do while you were gone is still waiting for you. How did his father treat him? With love, with, with long suffering, with forbearance. His father treated him as if nothing had changed. He had lost half, his for, half of his father's uh, fortune, but he treated him as if he was, if he was in that same position as a son. So we think about who God is. God, doesn't, God isn't waiting there. We think sometimes it's God waiting, you know, waiting his arms crossed for us to show up so he can, he can uh, come down on us. So, yep, I knew you were going to fail. I knew you were going to suffer. That's not what God's waiting for. What's he waiting for? He's waiting to throw his arms around us and bring us back in. So when we think about that time when we, when we fall, getting back up, repentance uh, he's waiting for us and we should, be rep- we should be repenting because of his goodness. So what hinders us from repentance? The f- Our pride is one of those. The first one we see is the love for sin. 1 John chapter 2. Y'all know this verse or this passage. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. 
But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I would say that this is probably one of the hardest things for believers, I would say even Western American believers, um, to, 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 uh, as a hindrance to our repentance. Because what's he say there? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. What's our American dream? When, when we say the American dream that was painted in the 50s and 60s, what did that look like? Yeah, a spouse, a home, a car, kids. I mean, it's things, right? And that's just what he's talking about there. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Sometimes our love for this world is what? Keeping us in, from repenting. Our love for our sin. Uh, it may not be anything that we think is horrible or evil or, or despised, uh, despised, but it may be simple things. It may be other things in our lives uh, that become idols, that keep us away from what God wants us to do. And this is one that you know, I would say this is challenges me. And I know Brother uh, Pastor Monteith and I have talked about this before, just in the, you know, having uh, just the, the trials of this life and challenges of this life and the burdens that we place upon ourselves that are our own choice, whether it's uh, you know, a house, a car, those things that we think we need, and many times we do, but sometimes we make choices about them that become burdens. They become heavy on our lives. And they, you know, we, love, we start to love them more. I love my grass. My gra- I don't have grass. Uh, Rachel knows this. I don't have grass. My butt. You know, some people just love their lawn. Oh, this is a, they spend hours and days in working on their lawn or their garden. Um, or they have a house that's just you know, pristine and they clean their house all the time, which is great to clean, right? Hopefully you have a clean house. Um, but if that's all I do and I don't use my house to serve God, what am I using it for? It's myself. It becomes my sin, my love. I don't repent of those things. I mean, you're like, well, I don't have those bad things in my life. Well, yeah, but I may have things that are keeping me from God. So our love for our sin uh, is one that keeps us. As mentioned, our pride and self-will. We think of uh, Jonah. You can turn there real quick. Jonah chapter, uh, chapter 1. can get to Jonah. This is what happens when you don't use, when I use an app all the time. And I'm skimming right by it and it's not popping up on the corner. I need the button. (laughs) All the minor prophets are stuck together. So we think about Jonah. There we are. We think about Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. What was Jonah doing? What did God tell Jonah to go do? Go preach to Nineveh, right? Jonah refused. Jonah decides to go in the opposite direction. Jonah is living in sin, right? Does Jonah do anything like evil? You know, is he like hanging out somewhere where he shouldn't be, like in, you know, you know some uh, seedy part of town? No, Jonah's on a cruise, trying, trying to get away from where God wants him to be. But Jonah, in his own pride, won't repent. Look where he's at. He says there in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 10, And so the storm has come up. He's on this ship. The storm has come up. uh, And let's see, in verse 9, and he said, and he said, uh, actually verse 8, and they said unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? Why, why, what is thy country, and what people art art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of of heaven, which made the heaven and the dry land. And the men were exceeding afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And, when he, and then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee? And the sea, that the sea may calm, uh, be calm unto us, for this sea wrought and was temp- tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me and cast me forth into the sea, so that the sea shall be calm unto you. And for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought, and it was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. 
Let, O Lord, let us not uh, perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. It's interesting as we think about Jonah here. Does Jonah repent anywhere in this before he gets cast into the sea? Jonah knew of his sin, right? He was the, he, he, they said in there, what, in verse, uh, let's see, in verse, uh, I guess it was 10, he says, for the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because what? He had told them, I'm freeing from the presence of the Lord. Jonah knew that was a sin, right? He had to know. I'm fleeing from the presence. I'm doing something wrong. But was Jonah ready to turn from his wrong direction? He didn't say, throw me overboard so I can swim back in the way God wants me to go. Jonah was so much in his pride and self-will. What was he willing to do? He was willing to commit suicide. He's like, guys, throw me over. I'm ready to die. I'm not going to repent. We think about our own pride and self-will. Sometimes we're, are we that, that stubborn, that committed to not do what God wants us to do, that we're willing just to say, you know what? The sea is about, is about, to, fall, is about to swallow me up. Just throw me in. We think about our own repentance. Are we allowing pride to keep us uh, from repenting? We also think of the ignorance of God's goodness. We talked about that. The idea that our repentance should come because of God's goodness. But maybe it's because we're ignorant of his goodness. We don't know his goodness. Uh, for 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. The idea that we know that sin is ultimately what? It's ultimately hurtful. But God's commandments are wholly helpful. We think about a parent walking a child. If you're ever going, going down through the woods, going down a trail, going on a hike somewhere, if you've got a little one, what are you going to do? You're going to hold on to him a little further, a little tighter. And as, as believers, we're like, you know, or we understand that God's commandments are what? They're helpful. That guidance that that parent is giving to that child, you, even if they, you let them go a little bit and walk in front of you, you may kind of keep your hands kind of to the sides of them so they don't toddle off a rock or something that they're climbing over. Why is that? Why do we, why do, we do that as parents? Because we love our kids. We know that it, you know, there are our guidance, our protection, um, staying within the bounds that we've given is, is, is keeps us safe. Um, I've gone on a, we went on a hike before and I was going down the trail and all of a sudden a um, rattlesnake ran across the trail. And, you know, you think about that. If, our kid, if my kid was there, my kid's just running around and climbing all over the, off the trail and going all over here. What are they going to run into? They're going to run into the snakes, right? And as a believer, sometimes we're like, well, you know what? It's okay to go over here on the trail or over there on the trail. But ultimately, what are we going to find? It's, it's harmful. It's going to hurt us. We're really going to get lost. We're going to find something that's going, to, that's going to bite us. But God's commandments are wholly helpful. The paths that he's created, the commandments, it says they're what? They're not grievous. The idea that they're, they're not there to, hurt, to, to, to give us a hard time. They're there to help guide us and protect us. So when we think about what, what keeps us from, understand, from repenting, it's not understanding God's goodness. We also know that sin has pleasure. That the, it, it, we talked about this, about the, the idea of our flesh and our, our spirit and those that war together. Hebrews chapter 11. Choose, and we think of Moses. And Moses decided not to live with the daughters of Pharaoh, but to what? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Moses gave, gave up those, those, this, this, the pleasures of sin for a season. He turned away from him. Why? Because he had, rec he had respect unto the recompense, recompense of the reward. That's a, that's a tongue twister there. But the idea is has what? He understood what the reward was for giving up that. He understood the goodness of God. Who had greater riches? God or Egypt? God, by far. He understood that. And he says there what? He gave that up because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. There are two times we repent, says the author, when we love Jesus enough or when sin becomes painful enough. We think about that. Where should repentance come? Where should it come from? Because we love Jesus enough. The righteous man, what? Falls seven times and gets back up. What does the wicked man do? 
is, is, is lost in his mischief, right? The idea that is uh, eventually they'll become painful enough that the wicked man will want to repent. But our, uh, the righteous, the just man does what? He repents because he loves God, because he's just, because he cares, or he knows what God care, that care, God cares for him. So then the question comes is, why is repentance repetitive? If I repented at salvation, why do I got to keep repenting? Why do I keep falling? It says a just man falls seven times and keeps getting back up. Why do I have to keep repenting? 1 John chapter 2. Who was John in here that's writing this? Who was John? 1 John. It's not his title. It's the book. Who was 1 John that wrote this? Apostle of Jesus, right? He was, he was, he was the beloved, right? He was the one that, 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 was, that was close by Jesus. He was one that he understood what it meant, I would hope, what repentance meant, right? Because he walked with Jesus. He saw, as believers, I mean, this, he was responsible for Jesus' mother. Like, he had a close relationship with Jesus. And he says, they're my little children. Who's he talking to there? Believers. believers. He's talking to believers. And, I, and this, this picture that he creates there, my little children, these things I write unto you that you what? Sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. We looked at that verse earlier. He says, when we sin, what's he say there? He knows we're going to sin, but he says what? We should be sinning not. As little children, what should we be doing? If a kid sees something bad, what do they do? Or scary, what do they do? They run to their parents, right? That's the idea. When we see sin in our lives, what should we be doing? Running to God the Father. We should be running, running because what? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Uh, we, I don't live in this world, but for those that have lawyers, um, they actually have a team of lawyers behind them. If they do something wrong, where do they go? I'll call my lawyer up. I mean, that's what he's talking about here. He says, what? If, you know, we, we don't have to worry because what? We've got a lawyer. We've got an advocate and it's the best advocate, right? He's, he's the advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, what? The righteous. He's the, perfect, he's the perfect advocate for us. He is our righteousness. So as believers, why do, we, why do we have to repent repetitively? Because we're going to sin, but we have an advocate. We'll see here. First off, victory is incremental. We think about our Christian life. We talked about this. So when we get saved, our spiritual DNA changes, right? We become, we become a, a, a child of Christ, or a child of God. We become, our, 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 our relationship has changed. We have now become in his family. And so we become, we become one with him, but we're still bound in this body, right? We still have our flesh. We still have this life that we have to live. So we think about the victory that we have. It's incremental. We've looked at this verse before in 2 Peter 3.18. It says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. You know, we think of growth. We think of development. And develop, it says grow in grace and knowledge. Uh, I think of kind of the work site. You think of a master or skilled person. Um, we've been doing some uh, bathroom renovation stuff. Um, not not on the timeline we wanted to, but because we had uh, had an issue we had to take care of. Um, but you start watching like this old house, and you start seeing these uh, these uh, master craftsmen that do these things, and they know exactly how to uh, you know mud the brick when they're putting masonry in and all this stuff, and they know exactly how to do that stuff. Do they get that overnight? Okay, I, I'm gonna, I'm going to sign up to be a, a, a mason, and I'm just going to know it tomorrow. How do they get to know exactly how to do that brick so that wall comes out straight or that wall doesn't fall down next year? It's practice, right? It's incremental. It's growth. Uh, do you, is it all of a sudden that you just see, okay, they got it? Like overnight, they got it. No, it's growth. It's, it's learning. It's, it's, it's shadowing. We think of the seed. Um, I've tried to grow stuff before. I'm not I'm always good at it. Um, sometimes I surprise myself and actually stuff actually grows and I can eat it. But the idea that I'm that waiting for things to grow, I'm like, man, I don't see anything going here. I don't see it growing. Sometimes in our own Christian life, that's what it's like. How, how quickly do we grow as believers? One day at a time, one decision at a time. I can't all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to be Paul tomorrow. I'm going to be the, the uh, missionary's missionary and, and I'm going to win the world all tomorrow. 
What, what did Paul have to do? Even Paul, what did he have to do? He got sent away into the desert, right? God sent him away and said, go learn. Go learn and me grow. Paul had a, we think of Peter. Did Peter's leadership as an apostle all of a sudden, you know, was it perfect? No, it took time. It took growth. It took him denying Christ for him to start to learn what it meant to love Christ. We think of our victory. Our victory is going to be incremental. Sometimes we can't even see it. We can't even perceive it. But it takes, it's, it's continually repenting and turning our eyes and turning our thoughts to Christ, acknowledging that wrong and turning to him. You see, victory is also seasonal. Oops, sorry. I, got, I didn't realize my visuals weren't there. Victory is seasonal. We think about God as, God as the builder. Uh, Philippians 1, uh, 6, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship, created in, in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath uh, before ordained that we should walk in them. We think of that building, that construction. Can I put the roof on before I put the walls up? But, but I, don't want the, I don't like the rain. Yeah, when I'm putting the walls up, I get rained on. Uh, can I just put the roof on? What's going to happen if I do that? If I don't have the walls right? The roof's not going to stay. Sometimes as believers, we want to jump ahead. We want to say, God, fix this in my life. I'm not ready. I, wanna fi- I want you to fix this. I'm not ready for you to work on this part of my life. But sometimes God's building the walls so the roof will stay up. So we think about our life. God's the builder. We're the project, right? Just like the, the, the clay. Can, can the, should you put a handle on a pot before you build the pot? You think of the clay and the clay wheel. If I put the handle on, what's going to happen? And then I start going around in the clay wheel. What's going to happen? The handle's going to go flying off or something. It's not going to stick. The idea that there's, there's a season that God is working on, maybe working on one part of our lives, but we're not working on another. And during that time, he's going to call things in our life that we need to repent on, Right? God, I wasn't ready for you to touch that part of my life, but I need you to. Uh, but that's the area that you're working on. So I need you. To, I need to be moldable in that part of my life. We also see that victory, similarly, not just being incremental. Sometimes it's, it won't always be measurable. We think of the race. We talked about this example a few weeks ago. We think of the race in uh, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for, who, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Sometimes we think of ourselves as the front of that marathon pack, right? We can see the finish line. We can see where we're going. But the reality is we're way back. If you can look way back in the back there, around the corner, around the bend, we're way back in that back of the pack. If you've ever run in those kind of races, you forget about the, 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 the course. You're just, you're just running, and you're focused on your race. I'm not focused on the first person in the race. I'm focused on my race. And that's what he's talking about there. Well, sometimes victory, does, it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. I'm running? Oh, that's another block. That block looked the same as the one I just passed. Sometimes in our Christian life, that's what the race looks like. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So every block that we run past, every, every section of road that we go down um, in our Christian life, we may not see that measurement. We have measurable change. We just know that we're running. And so when we think about our repentance, some, God's working in our lives. And sometimes we may not feel like he's doing something. God, I got to repent about that again. I got to repent about that again. But what's the, what's the just man doing? Every time he repents, what's happening to his heart? He's, he's changing. He's, making his, his, he's letting his heart be moldable for the Holy Spirit to work more and more. And every time, he, every time God needs that piece of clay, what's happening? It's getting ready and more ready and more ready to become that pot that, God, that he can use. The idea that when we think about our victory, our victory is not always measurable. Uh, I, I, again, I go back to the potter and the clay and thinking of working that clay. Does that clay, if I'm working that clay for five, ten minutes and I'm kneading it and kneading it, does it look like a pot? After that 10 minutes, I've been kneading that clay. No, it doesn't feel like I did anything for 10 minutes. But it's getting it ready to be able to be molded. So we think in our lives, many times God's just getting us ready to be molded. And then we're reassured that eventually victory will one day be final. No matter all this repentance that we have, one day what's going to happen? We're going to be molded. (laughs) We're going to be turned into what he wants us to be. 
It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, it says, But thanks be to God, which give us, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is the idea is he says, you are on the winning side. Hold on. Don't give up. When we, when we slack off, when we, forget, when we fall, when we forget, as we looked at last week, if we fall, we should be what? Falling forward. We should continue to be getting back up, continuing to repent, but not repenting because it's, it's painful to fall down, but repenting because of the goodness of getting back up, the goodness of having him carry us, of having him work with us and, and support us and carry us through because he's paid the price. He's paid for all the punishments. And eventually we're going to see that victory uh, in, 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 in person. We're going to see that final victory. So we think about repentance. Hopefully you thought a little bit today about what repentance is and what it's not. Um, any questions or thoughts before we close about repentance? No? All right. Well, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Uh, you got about 10 minutes. So. I want to thank you for your time. Dear Lord, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to come together, Lord, and just thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for the reminder of your love uh, that no matter what, where we fall, Lord, or how often we fall, Lord, you're there for us. It's, you're not there to punish us or to, uh, you know, to, to shame us or anything else, Lord, but you're there for, to, to pull us up, Lord, to redeem us, to care for us. Put us back on the right path. And Lord, we just thank you for the, your goodness, Lord. Help us to realize your goodness every day. Lord, I know I fall and I, I don't uh, realize your goodness before it's too late sometimes. And Lord, I pray that you help me to, uh, be that, uh, to, to be repentant of the things in my life, Lord. And I help us as, as a church and as a body, Lord, help us to encourage each other to get back up, encourage each other to turn uh, and repent of our, uh, the areas in our lives zealously, Lord, so with, with, with energy and a desire to serve you. Lord, help us, help our hearts to be moldable. Help our hearts to be ready for your word each and every day. And we thank you for the work that you're doing in us. And we thank for the, the uh, fruit that you're going to produce in the end. And uh, we just pray for the services today that everything's done for your honor and your glory. And uh, that we may be able to give you the praise for everything that, that occurs today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.